Hey, welcome to Overtime, where we take Sunday's message further. My name is Jeremy, and I'm your host. And this is a podcast where we just want to ask the questions that we think that you would ask as it relates to Sunday's message. And as we do so, we hope that it helps you grow in your life and your faith. With that being said, be sure to hit that subscribe button so you can stay up to date on all of the podcasts that are coming out. Not only that, hit the like button, because when you do so, it helps us help other people. And if you ever have a question about Sunday's content or about Overtime, you can submit those to overtime at npaustin.com, and we will be sure to get to those in future podcasts. So with that being said, here's a quick recap of Sunday, and then we're going to jump into our conversation today. And what Paul taught us, what Jordan talked about last week, is that every single one of us are born into Adam. He says, when Adam sinned, the entire world was affected. One man's disobedience opened the door for all humanity to become sinners. So also, one man's obedience opened the door for many to be made perfectly right with God. And when you transfer your trust from Adam to Jesus Christ, you are baptized into Jesus, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Why? Because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. He says, but this gracious gift leaves us free from our many failures and brings us into, look at this, perfect righteousness of God, acquitted with the words, not guilty. If you are no longer the person you used to be, you no longer have to live the way you used to live. In other words, you are 100% free in Christ. So, Buck, uh, we're going to jump in. Yes. Uh, you, you, uh, so me being someone who's on the team that you referenced on <laughs> Sunday, I just want to acknowledge that uh, you talked about the Oreo again, and you, <laughs> ju- you just did it. You blatantly <laughs> talked about the Oreo. As you guys told me not to. Yes. Do not talk about the Oreo, and yes. I shall talk about the thing you told me not to talk about. But I will say, I was someone, you know, I'd stood in your office, and I was like, what if you talk about the fact that you're not supposed to talk about the Oreo? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's a new way in which you can still talk about the Oreo. Yeah. And, uh, have, See? have you had an Oreo since Sunday? No. No. But I had some Saturday night. <laughs> and I did to really get yourself in the mood for Sunday, and not even uh, it just happened. It yeah. just was a natural occurrence of the Oreo. <laughs> yeah. Well, you didn't share the story about going to tech and taking Caleb's Oreos off his bed. You didn't share that in in our message prep meeting. Oh no, so that was brand new to me on Sunday, <laughs> and I was like, "That is hilarious." Yeah, that well, is amazing. He got so I found out he got the pack three packs of family size double stuffed Oreos. Uh-huh. He received them, and they all laughed. So even though in my brokenness and stealing of his Oreo, there's laughter to be found. Yes, <laughs> so yes. I'm, I'm grateful for that. Yep, yep. Mm-hmm. That was good. It was a very, uh, It was. Uh, I was just, your, your humility on stage with uh, that story. Well, it's just so, I just love those <coughs> things. Uh, and I, there's an ebb and flow with them, yep. you know? Yep. I'm trying to avoid them for the next, uh Several months. Yeah. <laughs> See how that works. There, uh, I've heard uh, our, our buddy Chris McSorley talk about, uh, he uses the, the term no-break foods. Mm-hmm. And these are the foods that when he has these foods, like all the breaks go off. Like, oh. And he just cannot like stop. So so for me, like pizza is one of those. Oh, no-break food? Like I'm, I'm, I look at like an entire pizza and I'm like, that physically will not fit in my stomach. But you do it. But I do it. And yeah. I'm like, I feel, why do I do that? Yeah. Why do I do what I do? Exactly. You know, it's amazing. Yep. So many things. So many. I'll have another story this week yeah. <laughs> to share. Yeah. Why do I do the very things I do not want to do? Well, what's really funny too is uh, we, we banter all the time. So, our, our number one value here at North Point as a staff is to prioritize personal health. Mm-hmm. And uh, we always make the jokes because people to show appreciation or just to say, you know, they see what we're doing or whatever, we'll drop off food, it's, you know, <laughs> in the kitchen. And so there's chicken minis, there's yes. round rock donuts, there's all these things. And we're so grateful. And at the same time, it is like very, very difficult. Yeah. To hold on to our values. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. It's very difficult right there outside of our offices. Yeah. So anyways, if you're a healthy person listening to this, kudos to you. <laughs> uh, you're probably like, these guys need a lot of, of help. Yeah, and maybe he, they should come on the podcast. Yeah. Like just email yeah, us. Yeah. Maybe you should you meet with on. us and, and yeah. all that. But uh, before we jump in, there's one thing I wanted to say to our listeners and our viewers uh, for this podcast. And one of, one of those things is that we are currently looking for someone to help and partner with us on this podcast. And so what we're looking for is someone who can kind of jump in as an overtime producer. And uh, 
um, essentially like help run, manage, lead this podcast. There's so much opportunity um, that we see with this thing, and we want to take it in a lot of a lot of different areas. Um, but the the uh, we just need someone who's really passionate to come and help make that a reality. Yeah. And so um, if anybody would be interested in talking about being the overtime producer, mm-hmm. um, please reach out to me uh, via email, Jeremy dot at Um, I don't, yeah, go on our website to figure out how to spell that, I guess, <laughs> <laughs> or just email us at overtime at mpawson.com. That's a much better yeah. uh, way to do that. So, um, and I, I'd love to talk to someone about that. We're just looking for someone who loves content, loves, you know, listening to overtime, you know, is passionate about people, um, taking these concepts further and just wants to partner with our team and help us do that. I love it. So, uh, but today we're uh, kind of following Set Free Part 2, and we have been talking throughout the series about that very dynamic you and I just described, why do we do what, he do, what we do? Mm-hmm. And we've been talking about uh, the, the main problem that Jordan talked about in Part 1 is sin. Sin is the thing. It's now living in us through Adam, and there's a whole lot there. And so if someone's listening to this and you did not listen to Part 1, or really Part 2, to, it's going to feel like you're just getting bits and pieces because we're, yeah. you know, we're brushing over really big concepts. But um, one of the things you did on Sunday is that you did Romans 0, 0 which is not <laughs> a real verse, but that was the point. And because it was Paul saying, what will rescue me from this, this path, essentially? Um, and you said it's not a what, but that's the question we always tend to ask. Mm-hmm. We always ask, what, what is it going to be? Is it going to be some program, some book, some, something like that? Mm-hmm. But um, it's more of a who, and that who being the person of Jesus. And so, um, so we tend to focus on the what a lot more. Uh, why do you think we do that? And then how can we shift better to the who overall in, the, in, our, in our struggles or our battles, whatever it might be? Sure. I think, I mean, the what's just so tangible. The what's right in front of us. The what is pragmatic. The what's like, mm-hmm. oh, okay, you know. And the what is what, uh, you know, sells books a lot of times. The what's are, you know, it's like it's the quick fix, the silver bullet, you know, those kind of things. And so it's just so tangible, so in front of us. And it's kind of our natural, like, <coughs> you know, first step is to go, Hey, I'm doing something I shouldn't be doing, or maybe there is something I should be doing. I'm not doing right. And so what should I do? You know, what, what's the, what's going to be the fix. And, and, and that's, like I said on Sunday, that's part of it. Like that's a, it's, it's going to be part of the equation, part of, you know, how you're going to be set free. It's, there's a lot of great what's, but if you're really going to get be set free, which I think is possible, and that's going to be a reality for you, for me, for everyone listening, um, then you've got to go deeper than that. You've got to get to the core. You've got to get to the foundation. And again, I reference it all the time, but a book that you referenced or you have told me about that <laughs> you have not, have you finished it yet? What? The book? What happened to you? Yeah. Yes, what happened? I finished it. Okay. Yeah. So I'm not <clears throat> sure if you would recommend it or not because I haven't I, read the book. I would recommend it. Okay. It's a fantastic book. Yeah. So the book, you know, what happened, you know, oftentimes like if we're doing something in our marriage, we're doing something in our dating relationship, we're doing something with our friend, we're doing something with our son or daughter or something that we know we shouldn't do. The natural response is look at somebody and goes like, yeah, what, what the hell's wrong with you? Like what's going on? What's, what, you know, and that's where we, and we say this to ourselves, like our self-talk is to, what's wrong with me? You know, what, what's go And it's, that's a great question. It's, you know, good self-reflection, but the better question is getting to the who is what happened to you? And for me in my personal experience, life experience, the longer I sit on the other side of people, the more I hear stories, the more I hear struggles, the more, you know, as a pastor, you can imagine, you know, I hear a lot of these stories every single week. It's, it's always a deeper issue at hand. There's always something to the core. And so the question is like, you know, not what, but you know, what's, it's, it's, you know, what happened to you? What's, what's the background story? Give me the context. And so that's like, Hey, I struggle with this. And then I hear about, you know, a father that, that neglected. There's a who behind that. Mm-hmm. Or I hear about, man, I'm unable to share any of my emotions. So a lot of men, and I know this is a generalization, but a lot of men say, you know, or a lot of wives will say to their husbands or a lot of men will say, I just can't, like, you know, share and be real. And, you know, a wife says, my husband just feels so numb. He feels so, like, absent. He feels so not there. And it's like, you know, the who is a mother that perhaps neglected the soul of a son or ne- neglected the soul of their child. Mm-hmm. And so it's, you always find, like, somebody b- betrayed trust, and therefore there's a struggle today. Somebody did abuse, therefore there's a struggle today. Which, again, it pushes you to the core issue of the who. Mm-hmm. But even beyond that, 
like what I was talking about on Sunday, like there, that's the lowercase who, and that's important to understand. But then beyond that, beyond that is the uppercase who is the, is the one that if that's what happened, perhaps it's the lowercase who, then our way forward perhaps is the uppercase who, which is our heavenly father. And that's what I was pointing to because ultimately the who goes to your identity, the who goes to your core, the who goes much deeper in the human fabric either your mom, your dad, a friend, a a relationship that betrayed you, and ultimately your heavenly father. So we've got to get to the core to set an individual free or for any person to be set free. You got to deal with a who. Yeah. I would also just add on to that. It's not just what happened to you, but what didn't happen to you or for you. Mm -hmm. You know, many men just, uh, it's like the story you share about the guy who, who, you know, came in your office in tears and he's like, I just heard my dad say, I love you for the first time in my life. And he's like 18 years old or something, Yeah, you know, and, and sometimes it's, yeah, what didn't happen, what wasn't ascribed, what, what, you know, blessings of a father were not given, um, that leaves kind of an empty space or a hole for someone to, to go try to fill those with other things or, or yeah. walk around kind of empty, you know? Yeah. Well, even the story of my dad, I mean, my dad came over last night for, um, uh, dinner and we were talking and again, I was just reminded his father never told him, uh, that he loved him mm. like no physical affection. The only way he showed my dad affection and love was through money. Like he would buy him like the cool cars. My dad drove like a road runner back in the sixties or whatever. Yeah. In the sixties and, you know, had all these like cool yeah. gadgets. That was the expression of love, which is why my dad has struggled with money and, um, and equating that with love. But what he discovered was it, what he, didn't happen was his dad never showed him affection. His dad never looked him in the eyes and said, son, I'm proud of you and I love you and you belong to me. You're wonderful. Mm-hmm. That never happened. Right. So there was a struggle as a result of the who. Yep. Yep. And that's, that's exactly what we're honing in on. And you, you talked about identity um, a little bit in there, and I want to dive in a little bit more into that. Um, Donald Miller has this amazing quote. He says, at the core of which character is, of, at the core of which character is in our story, meaning like who we are, um, is our identity, who we believe we are, who we are directs our story more than anything else. Discipline isn't the problem. Identity is. Mm-hmm. I thought that was such an amazing quote because so often we go like, oh, there's a problem. Let me find the what. And, and sometimes there's even like a, um, uh, I don't know, a, a masculine, like I'm going to discipline my way through this or out of this. And, mm-hmm. and there's truth in that for sure. I mean, sure. there's, you know, there's mental health, uh, benefits and all sorts of stuff to, to trying to discipline your way out of a problem, but your identity can remain unchanged and that's at the core of what's really happening. Mm-hmm. And so, so let's unpack that a little bit. Why is identity so important here? And, and why is it more of a difficult problem to focus on than the band-aids that we tend to put on the problem? Yeah, I think, you know, identity is a sense of self and a sense of self-worth. And so it's, you know, and your sense of self is the engine that drives everything. Your sense of worth is the engine that drives everything. It drives behavior, it drives attitude, it drives actions. So, again, getting to the core of that, if we're going to change our actions, if we're going to change our feelings, if we're going to change a lot of the things and be set free, because that's what this whole series is about, we have to get to the identity, which is getting to the who. Because again, as I alluded to earlier, there's the lowercase who, which is like, this is us trying to find our identity, which is like, hey, if I, you know, I'm really successful, then I'm good. If I have a lot of money, then I'm, you know, amazing. If I have this title, look at me in my corner office. If I run the ball on the field really, really well, or, you know, catch the ball or whatever it is, sports. Yep. And uh, now the sudden, it's, it starts determining, you know, our, uh, our identity, which is our view of self and our view of self-worth, because look at all these things, but all of those things can easily fade. All of those things can easily be taken away. All of those things can easily go away. And all of those things are not transcendent. They just don't transcend all the different seasons of life. It's like, you know, it's like the whole Tom, Br- Tom Brady, you know, he's kind of in the press, but <clears throat> we've played a clip of um, his interview after the third Super Bowl. When he was like, hey, look at everything I've done, all my accomplishments, it should fulfill that self-worth. It should fulfill my self-image, like who I, it should fulfill this. And then, you know, then the interviewer's like, so three Super Bowls in, how's it doing? He's like, it's just not doing it. And he's like, there's got to be something more, something that transcends all of this. Mm -hmm. And then the interviewer asked like, what do you think it is, Tom? (laughs) And he's like, hell, I wish I knew. Yeah. You know, he's like, I don't know. And again, maybe it, he maybe he found it after six. What does he have six now? 
I think six or seven. Six or seven? Yeah, I don't I don't know. I don't know. Anyways. A whole lot. A whole lot. So I think again, I think Donald Miller was on to something, which you gotta go to the uppercase who. You've gotta go to the transcendent who. You've got to go to the who inside of time and outside of time, not to the finite who, which all the finite things will fade away. That's why we keep chasing. You've got to go to the infinite who, which is your heavenly father. And I think you got to start there. And uh, even this morning, like my personal time with God, I'm in the letter of Romans. I happen to be in Romans as we're talking about Romans, which every now and then this kind of aligns. And I'm like, wow, this is so cool. But this morning I was reading Romans 8 and I thought, oh my gosh, here it is, an identity thing. And this is so life-giving. This is so empowering. This is this gives you the power to say no. This gives you the power to be set free when you are constantly being like fed, like nourished by, uh, like if you sit by a stream and the waters are just nourishing you. And so I read today in Romans 8, it said, for the Holy Spirit makes God's fatherhood real to us as he whispers into our innermost being, you are God's beloved child. That's who you are. So anything outside of that is not true. In Christ, you are God's beloved child. You're beloved. You're worth loving. You're perfectly worth loving. And <clears throat> that kind of that kind of habit, that kind of thing, that kind of like reminder infuses an identity and empowers you to do things you otherwise were unable to do. And that is what sets you free. That allows you to step into the design of God consistently. That allows you to forgive yourself because you're human and you're in need of a savior. That allows you to get up and say, you know, I'm not only forgiven, but I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Today's the day God has made and I'm going to rejoice. I'm going to have joy in it and move forward because of who I am. And so um, that's Identity, again, comes to the core, and I think we struggle with this, um, you know, because I think there's just an enormous tidal wave of things uh, externally to you and me that tell us otherwise. Yeah. I want to connect a couple dots here because we're, we're getting down into the weeds of identity, but um, this is still such an integral part of Set Free mm -hmm. and what the series we're in is because if we are to be free to truly see ourselves in Christ, as you talked about on Sunday, mm -hmm. um, we have to look at what obstacles are keeping us from truly seeing ourselves as in Christ, as you're mm -hmm. talking about, and it's that tidal wave of things. Um, and this is, I mean, again, we're, we're focusing on the who, we're not focusing on the what, but one of the things I notice, and I feel like it's particularly true of my generation, you know, more millennial generation, is the search for identity is just rampant all over the place. Mm -hmm. It's just, who am I? And you got to go here. You got to do this program. You got to read this book to discover who you are. And it's just like people cannot look in the mirror and just see the person across, sit looking back at them and be like, that's who I am. Mm -hmm. Like they're just, they cannot like stomach that. And I think the number one reason that they cannot see who they are and, and love themselves just as they are is because of shame. And shame is such a huge part of that tidal wave, I think, mm -hmm. that keeps people from becoming secure in their identity to the point that they can see themselves in Christ to the point that they can be set free from the things that shackle them. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So let's talk about shame a little bit. And you talk about a book, a bunch, mm -hmm. that I know has been really influential for you called Healing the Shame That Binds You. Mm -hmm. And there are some overlapping things, themes here as we talk about sin and identity and shame. Um, but where do you see all of these things kind of overlap and how is this significant to like our, our struggle to be set free? Right. Yeah, I, I uh, well, I think uh, shame's a huge part of it, um, and um, I think shame is something that God gave us as a wonderful gift, and shame is something that be can become a terrible enemy of our lives. And so it's, uh, you know, shame is that thing you bump into that's like, oh, that's not right, or oh, that's not good, or oh, that's that's bad, or oh, that's... That's not that's not healthy, the, you know. That's the shame piece, and and there's a wonderful side to that that I think you know we see in the very beginning of the scriptures, <clears throat> when you know Adam tried to be something he was not. He tried to be more than human, and all of a sudden he bumps into that and he tries to act upon it, and when he did, he felt ashamed. Now th that's the good part of sh uh, feeling ashamed. Like if you and I bump into something, I feel ashamed. And I wrote a couple things down. I said, the good side of shame allows us, it's the emotion that gives us permission to be human. Like all of a sudden I'm like, oh, 
I'm human. I don't have to be perfect. And mm-hmm. I'm reminded of that as a result of shame. Shame tells us our limits. Shame keeps us uh, in our human boundaries, letting us know we can and will make mistakes and that we need help. Uh, shame tells us we are not God. I think there are several people that perhaps you've been around, I've been around. If you're watching or listening, you've been around that you're like, seriously, you need a little shame in your life. Yeah. <laughs> you, they it, take you off that pedestal. Yeah, they, they feel like they have to be God. Healthy shame is, you know, the psychological foundation of humility. What gives you humility, what is, you know, which is the antidote to pride is shame. That's a wonderful thing. And it's, you know, feeling ashamed. And it's the source of spirituality. In, in other words, I am in need of a savior. I am in need of something transcendent. I am in need of a mirror that's not culture, a mirror as you alluded to earlier. That's something of divine. That's something uh, that's infinite. That's something far beyond the winds of culture. Right. So... Because I keep bumping into things, and even though I want to do the right thing, I, I can't even do the right thing. And even though, you know, all these kind of things, and my wife keeps reflecting, or my girlfriend keeps reflecting, or my husband keeps, and I'm just, I'm just human, yeah. and I need something beyond me that is divine. Yeah. And so that's a wonderful thing. And, and really quick, before you go any further, I sure. just want to acknowledge that uh, shame and how shame gets talked about in the church and even in like psychological circles, mm-hmm. most of the time is talked about in a negative context. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and that's, and I think that's because it's not clearly defined. And what you're talking about here is more the healthy parts of shame and yeah. the shame that has the negative context that we are more, and we've talked about a lot, even on these podcasts and on mm-hmm. our sermons and in our, you know, on Sunday mornings, that it's more the toxic side of shame. Like there's a good part and a toxic part. Exactly. Um, and it's really funny as you, as you were talking about the healthy part of shame, I'm listening to David Goggins book, mm-hmm. uh, can't hurt me. Oh yeah. And which, uh, I can recommend as a good <laughs> listen, but if you're someone who doesn't like profanity, then I would maybe like <laughs> take it all with a grain of salt. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's it's pretty out there but one of the things he talks about is one of the best things you can do to yourself if you want to lose weight is look in the mirror and say i've gained a couple pounds <laughs> because yeah. most people are looking in the mirror and they're like i'm not fat i'm not blah 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 yeah. and it's like they're not honest with themselves yeah. and so they don't have the ability to change yeah whereas like there's a healthy shame to go yeah, I'm not perfect. I've gained a couple pounds. Let me see right. if I can go ahead and do something different. Right, and the know? honesty, again, it's all kind of, it's all connected here because the, the ability to have humility, the ability to have honesty is because your, your identity has integrity. Your identity's intact. It's secure. I'm, not, I'm okay being not, I'm, I'm okay being human. Mm-hmm. I'm okay not being perfect. I'm okay even failing because I'm going to learn so many things in that. Yep. And when, so for me, when I bump into feeling ashamed, that's a wonderful thing. I'm like, ah, oh, crud, you know, I messed up here. And so it reminds me I'm in need of a savior. It reminds me I'm not human. I wrote down when, you know, I bump and, and I cross a line, you know, like with Jill in my relationship or I cross a line with the boys or something like that. It, it reminds me of my imperfection. It gives me an opportunity to grow. It gives me an opportunity to learn. It gives me an opportunity to seek something beyond myself. Right. Not to question my identity, my worth, my value, but just to go, yeah, I'm human. I am created. I'm not the creator. I'm finite. I'm not infinite. And so that bumping is wonderful. In addition to the, I think that bumping, some people call it our conscience or, you know, the, or conscious, that, pe- that piece of us that says, oh, that's not good. That is, I think that's a God design. That's a God thumbprint on you saying you're operating outside of your design. Like there is a design I designed you specifically with that has purpose, meaning, joy, contentment, you know, peace to be found. You operate outside of that. Boom. I bump into that and I'm like, oh, I don't feel good. That's, that's, that's not, something feels not right. Well, you're bumping into something. And I think that's the very design of God that he put in the human fabric to go, Hey, you should feel ashamed. So I think even like God's law, God's design, God's things are all in there. And it's a wonderful thing. I think we should pay attention to it. Adam bumped into it and he went, oops, you know, yep, yep. I felt ashamed. Now where, where it begets, as you alluded to earlier, um, where it gets, tricky and where it gets where we hear about it in the context is when it becomes part of our state of being when it transforms and it says now it's who i am Mm -hmm. it goes i move from feeling ashamed to feeling shame i shouldn't do that that's wrong that's not best is feeling ashamed feeling shame is the idea i'm wrong i'm not good i'm broken i'm a mistake and that toxic shame is one of the areas that 
is rocket fuel for us to do the very things that we're talking about in the series. So I do the very things I shouldn't do. I know the things I should do, but I don't do. What is going on? Well, shame is rocket fuel to that stuff. So if I don't feel perfect, well, now I have to be, have to create a false self. So I feel flawed. So I'm going to go create a false self that has to be perfect. So I'm a perfectionist now. Mm -hmm. Well, perfectionism is, I mean, almost every single time you can go to the core of your identity and find shame hanging out in perfectionism. It, you're designed not to be a perfectionist. I'm designed not to be a perfectionist. We should feel ashamed to remind us we're not perfect because there's only one who is perfect. That should be a reminder. We don't have to create a false self and be perfect, but the reason we do, and then we fail, and then we fail, and then that creates this vicious cycle is because that has to, that starts with shame. Same thing like if I feel flawed, I feel broken, I, I feel terrible. Well, then I have to have something that emotionally satisfies me. So that could be food, that could be porn, that could be work, that could be accomplishment, that could be working out my physical body. I have to look a certain way because I feel like at the core of who I am, I do not feel good. If I feel less than human, shame, that's the toxic side of shame. Well, now I have to be superhuman, and I'm going to accomplish everything. I'm going to be stronger than everybody. So you live in this false self, and sometimes if you're on the other side of somebody full of shame, not living in their true identity in Christ, you just want to almost grab them by their cheeks in the sweetest, most gentle, relational way and say, you know you're okay, right? Mm -hmm. You know, like, I just love you for you. Not all the things and all, just... And especially if you're a father, if you're a mother, you feel this with your kids. You just want to grab them and go, could you see you the way I see you? Because if you could be okay with you the way I'm okay with you, if you could see yourself as my beloved son, all this like hustle, all this struggle, all this stuff that you're so operating and all this failure you're taking so personal and you're thinking you're a failure now, you're thinking you're terrible, you're mixing guilt and shame. Guilt is the idea I've done something bad. Shame is the idea I am bad. So you've mixed them all up because you got confused with who you are in your identity. Right. And so it goes circles all the way back to the capital who to the transcendent you've got to look in the mirror of god not in the mirror of social media not in the mirror of culture because if you look at the mirror of culture and social media there is no truth to be found truth is relative to what you feel or what you think is is true to you there's something that transcends that that's much much better than that that now informs your conscience that informs your identity that empowers you to be set free and that's the mirror of god yeah there's a lot to unpack right there <laughs> in yeah. what you said. And, and I want to, you know, I, I feel myself because I'm learning about this right now and I'm reading some of these books we're referencing right now. Mm -hmm. I feel myself like squirm or like when I hear you say like, oh, we should be ashamed. But that's, it's such an important distinction to make. Like uh, being ashamed, mm -hmm. I'm kind of re reflecting, like processing it this out loud, yeah. is going, I am human. I am imperfect. Mm -hmm. I, I am like fundamentally like not going to be perfect because that's God. That's God. And I am not God. Yep. And that's feeling ashamed of something. And uh, feeling shame is not only am I imperfect, but now I need to create a false self so that I have to be perfect so people can see me perfect because I'm fundamentally flawed. And I'm and it's going down that whole a whole different layer of um, strapping that kind of identity and failure to to like who you are at your core. Right. And uh, this is why if your identity is found in, in the, in the winds of culture, if your identity is found outside of God, then uh, there's no way for feel uh, ashamed to stay healthy yep. because that's just going to go back to, it's going to infuse who your core is Yep. versus feeling ashamed just reminds me I need a savior. Feeling ashamed reminds me I'm not perfect and draws me to the one who is perfect. Feeling ashamed reminds me there are limits to being human, that my life is finite, that one day there's a life to come, that God, I, like I can't, but you can. It reminds me to go there. And it also reminds me to come, come back to the core of my identity and say, okay, who am I? Like, man, today's been a really tough day relationally. I've really, I've bumped into a lot of things. And it reminds me to be able to go that I'm the beloved son of God. I am fearfully and wonderfully made, as Psalms 139 says. So that means I can go and I can go apologize. I can go own my piece of the pie. I can go, you know, learn from my failures instead of having to, you know, pride, pridefully power up over my failures. Mm -hmm. 
And it gives me a posture of humility, which just in turn just makes relationships flourish. It allows, you know, your connection with your wife, your husband, your boyfriend, your girlfriend. It allows you like at work to be a better leader, to be a better team, be part of a team, everything. Because again, you go back to your core identity, which is not found in anything other than the transcendent God. If you don't find it there, then I, I don't know how shame doesn't seep in yep. to your identity. Yeah. And, and we're talking about, you know, being set free, you know, recognizing ourselves in Christ and identity. And we're talking about character change mm -hmm. throughout the series, really. I mean, we're talking about changing a core part of our character or a certain habit mm -hmm. or starting something different. And you cannot change your character, I think, unless you address your identity. I think everything character-wise is going to come from your yeah. identity. And, and so that's why we're, that's why we're kind of going, hey, you know, I'd say if someone's listening to this and they're they're going, oh my goodness, you're, you're peeling back layers that I haven't been able to see or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, I think reading Healing the Shame That Binds You is a great, great way to start to like just learn and grow and discover this for sure. you. Uh, reading one that we love here, Abba's Child is another great identity book. Um, starting to just have conversations around this, I think. Reading books is not going to solve the problem, but having it'll begin the conversation for you right. to bring this to God, to bring to the trusted friends and individuals to a counselor or something like that. Yeah, and even like, you know, things I've suggested in the past, I just think it's, you know, read Psalm 139 for 30 days in a row. That's what, you know, uh, 10, 11 years ago, one of the things my counselor told me to do, I was really struggling with shame. I was shaming my kids. I was shaming myself. I was shaming the people I'm around. I was shaming people at work. I was pastoring shame, you know, the yeah. whole thing. And to be able to break the cycle of toxic shame, which John Bradshaw talks about in his book, Healing the Shame That Binds You, which I don't agree with everything in there. So just take mm -hmm. that with a grain of salt. But it's really, really helpful. Lots of good principles is self-love, is to go like I, I have to look in the mirror and say I'm worthy of love. Well, what gives that an objective foundation? Because otherwise you're just telling yourself something that you may or may not know that's true. What makes it true is the object something outside of you. And what's outside of you that's objective is our Heavenly Father. And that's why I think, again, without God, I, I mean, you can tell yourself all these wonderful things, but ultimately you're gonna, there's going to be an insecurity in the truth you deliver to yourself. And that insecurity comes from where does this come from? Yeah. Why am I worth love? Why am I, should I love myself? Well, yep. you know, because my beauty. Well, that fades. Well, because my, well, what if something happens to your bank account? Well, my title. See, all those things are just, this is where God, who has, who has always been, that's in time and out of time, that is the uncaused cause, that nothing is dependent upon his existence outside of him. He's always been. He looks at you and says, you are the apple of my eye. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are my beloved son. Every day to start from the core right there with the, that core piece of your identity that's outside of you that gives it something objective, gives you a foundation to be able to set you free. Yeah. Yeah, and I think I think it's good to point out. I mean, I don't know. I haven't finished the book, but you talk about healing the shame that binds you, not agreeing with everything in it. Mm -hmm. I think I have not noticed yet him talk about God being a component of self-love. Mm -hmm. And perhaps that's kind of at the core of why we might not, uh, all the principles and some of the psychology yeah. and stuff is amazing. And it's how God designed our brains and stuff like that. But yeah, that's a crucial component, you know, to miss in this equation for sure. Sure. Um, okay. Last question. Sure. Uh, ending in, you know, in, in being living in Christ mm -hmm. saying sin is not my master. I mean, that's been the anchoring thought that we want people to take. Um, and we're trying to say that now as we work on our identity and try mm -hmm. to bring our identity more in the perspective of how God views us. Um, but how can we, how can we say that? And how can we just wake up each day and, and be more in Christ, um, every single day in hopes that one, you know, one day he would set us free. Uh, from whatever we're wrestling with. Yeah, I think um, this may sound pastoral, and it's because I'm a pastor. So <laughs> <laughs> how could you? <laughs> I know. How dare you? But, uh, you know, it's it's one of the things to go, you know, my counselor has told me for a long time, Buck, you, you want to become all these things. You want to become a great dad. You want to become a great father. You want to become secure. You want to, you know, have a great, you have to be to become. So there is a being part. And I would just say one of the greatest habits to create in your life, to remind you of what's true. It's like, as you so desire as a father, as you just so desire as a mother to look at your sons and daughters every single day and just say, sweetie, I love you. Sweetie, I'm proud of you. Not because of anything you've done. I'm just proud of you because of you. Like, I look at you and, man, my heart jumps because I love you so much. Like those things you want to tell your kids every single day. You have a heavenly father who wants to speak those words to you. And so one of the greatest habits is to wake up 
and to use an ac- uh, you know an acronym called SOAP S O A P to pick a scripture whatever that may be and to write it down to make observations about what you read what 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 did I read this morning what's interesting to me what questions come up you know what are the observations application is a what does this mean to me how how can this translate to my life what do I struggle with what what things did this highlight in my life and P just simply means to pray, it simply means to come to your Heavenly Father and just go. And so like this morning, you know, as I look at mine, um, and I send mine to my boys, uh, my three oldest boys, because they asked me to, because I've encouraged them to do soap a lot. And they're like, Dad, it's so hard. And I'm like, I know it's hard. But like, I'm like, what can I do to encourage you? They're like, would you just send me yours? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, okay, so it does put a sense of accountability because now I'm like, you know, there are some days I miss and they're like, dad, what happened? You know, and I'm uh, like, it's you're, okay. You're the pastor, aren't you? Yeah, and I bumped into feeling ashamed, which is fine. I say, yeah. hey, I'm less than human, but it doesn't change who I am. My identity is found in my heavenly father. So like this morning, I wrote, uh, read in Romans 8, 14 through 17. That's the scripture. A few observations I made. Maturity, I wrote one of the, uh, maturity is entrusting the ways of my heavenly father. He prompts, uh, you know, this truth. He prompts things for me to stay away. He prompts me from having that conversation or to go have that con- All the prompting, if I just trust him, that's where maturity is found. So, and then application. I put, you know, Buck, oftentimes you feel the tension of religious duty versus prompting of the spirit. Like I look at the activity God calls me to as religious duty versus I see it wrongly. And this is what I gleaned from the passage, that it's actually a prompting from the Spirit to experience life and life to the full. Like, if I trust Him, that's where maturity f- is found. If I trust Him, the prompting, like, oh, I know I ought to do that. That's the very Spirit of God inside of me. If I trust Him, that's where life, abundant life, is found. And so then my prayer I wrote down, Father, you, um, you are my beloved Father, and I'm asking you to provide clarity of thought, to see your promptings as good for me rather than something that I have or must do. This is life to be found in you, and I want that life. So help me. And that was simply my prayer. So in this passage, and I referenced it earlier, it just happened to be coincide with the podcast. It's the, uh, verse uh, 16 says, at the very end, you are my beloved. You are God's beloved child. That was a wonderful reminder today. In fact, I highlighted it, and I just said, wow, I need to be reminded of my core identity, not on the lowercase who, but on the uppercase who the transcendent, the objective to say, that's who I am. So that would be one of the greatest things every yep. single morning yep. to make it a habit and to do soap. Yep. And then I think, I think I would add on to that too. I mean, it seems like this is, this is being, uh, you know, do being a part of content in church for a long time. It's like mm-hmm. spend time with Jesus, be in community. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I just don't know how to get away from it. I mean, those yeah. are the most important things. Well, and if, the, if you're designed to do that, Meaning that's the core of your design. Yeah, then, we're not going to get away from that. I mean, right. that's, you got to spend time with your that. creator to to like step into that. Yep, yeah. yep. And I think I love I love the quote. I've heard it from many different people, but sobriety. And I think this is a series we're talking about sobriety. You know, mm-hmm. sobriety is not the opposite of addiction. Connection is, mm-hmm. and it's because we were designed. and And there's a lot of stuff in uh, the book What Happened to You about healing things that happened mm-hmm. to you. Um, through community, they, they 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 come to the same conclusion that we find in the scriptures, and and what happened to you is not necessarily a, a Christian you know a foundational book, but it's the same conclusion. It's you you cannot deal with this stuff. You cannot heal shame. You cannot um, see these things differently. See yourself differently outside of being in a community that reminds you of who you truly are. Right, and, and it's just it has to happen. And I'll reiterate it again. At and I'm just repeating myself, but you know I do that quite often. But again, connection and community is absolutely important with all the people around you. But ultimately, connection and community with the uppercase who, yeah. you know, your Heavenly Father is, is, is so core to your identity yep. and being able just to thrive in life. So as much as I can uh, encourage all connection, that is where life and happiness and joy and healing is found. But ultimate connection is with your Heavenly Father. Yep, yep. Awesome. 
Buck, it's been great to, to talk about this and unpack these things. And, uh, and, and again, go back to those resources. If, if you're, you're really resonating with the content today, um, you know, what happened to you is a great book. Mm -hmm. uh, Healing the shame that binds you is a great book. Abba's child is a great book. Mm -hmm. And there's definitely things in there that, um, you know, again, we might not fully agree with, but there are really, really good principles and concepts in there to pull from for this. So awesome. Um, awesome. Well, we are going to be, uh, we, we said sin is not our master this past week. And then, uh, week three, if you've been still going, well, what do I do? What do I do? <laughs> Which go back to part two and listen to it again if that's the case. Yeah. But um, we're gonna we're gonna get a little bit more practical in part three and four. And so I'm I'm excited to see where we go and we will see you guys on Sunday, 9 30, 11 in person or online. Yep. Thank you, man.